We're about to enter our Bible study this morning in Ephesians chapter 4. We're studying verses 22 and following. But before we begin, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments. And I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution, praying for the men and women of our militaries around the world. Once here fighting for our freedom, Father, we pray that you would build them up, protect them, encourage them, enable them to neutralize our enemies wherever they may exist. Pray for our policemen and women here inside America that you would build them up, protect them, encourage them, enable them to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. Father, we pray for our leadership in America. You would continue to raise up men who could guide our country by its constitution and thereby protect our freedom. Father, we pray for our friends around the world, our friends in Israel and Korea, the people of Ukraine, and our friends in the Philippines, Father, the ones in ministry. We pray that you would encourage them, enable them to carry your word wherever it may be wanted. For our friends on the prayer list, Father, the ones who are sick, we pray that you would heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. For our friends who are in pain, we pray that you would relieve their pain and remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who have lost loved ones, we pray that you be with them in their grief. Remind them of your precious promises, which brings the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 4 is a great chapter of the Bible, and uh, the book of Ephesians is probably one of, the, one of my favorite. And if you really just want some beautiful reading from your Bible... Grab a King James Version and read through the letter uh, to the believers at Ephesus. It really is a wonderful letter, and it's uh, elegant, and it has some wonderful language. But the truth is, the meat of the word is found in the original language, and that is where our focus is here. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 22 and uh, 23. It says here that you put off, and that means to change a piece of clothing concerning your former conduct, whether it is you as an unbeliever or you as a reversionist. The old man, and that is the flesh personified, which grows corrupt. That's the inward pressure calling the old sin nature to action according to deceitful lust. And we studied the lust patterns of the old sin nature. How do you recover from sin nature activity is the question, and it's answered in verse 23. And be renewed or restored in the spirit. And that word pneuma means breathing of your mind. Mind is part of the soul here. It's the staging area or doctrine or for truth and we're going to look at that upcoming session okay i want to pick up where we left off last week we've been working on how to break the dominance of the sin nature in the life truth is there is all flavors of christians there are baby believers who operate in the flesh most of the time. And just about the only time they remember to rebound is when they come to Bible class and they're reminded by their pastor, 
to use the rebound technique or use 1 John 1, 9, when they walk in, they say, oh, yeah, man, I haven't done that in a while. I should get confessed up to date. And then they sit in a Bible class, but their concentration span is about a really narrow. And before you know it, even in Bible class, they're out of fellowship. They're in a sin nature function. And so they, they, the brevity of time spent in the bottom circle, it's not much for the baby believer. He's caught up in the operation of the flesh, and that's the normal life. And when you see Christianity in general out here, you're, going to, you, you're seeing religiosity. You're seeing mostly function of the flesh. It's only when the believer begins to grow up spiritually and get some form of maturity that he'll actually function clean in his priesthood out here in the world. And he begins to keep a short account with God. And he recognizes when he sins, he gets angry. He says, Father, I know I failed. I got angry back there. I'm confessing it. And next time I'm going to see that temptation coming and I'm going to overcome discipline of thought. I failed this time, but I'm going to try and try again. And so when you begin to advance as a Christian, is see, the, the mature Christian spends a majority of time in fellowship, and the baby Christian spends a minimum of time in fellowship. And that is the characteristic of the life. And so when you grow up spiritually, you spend a maximum amount of time producing divine good. See, that's just an offshoot of maturity. And so, how are you going to break the dominance of the sin nature as a baby believer? Guess what? You got to come through the door. You got to get reminded. Hey, use the rebound technique. Get your sins confessed up to date. And when you stack a bunch of Bible classes on top of each other and the pastor keeps on telling you you need to keep your sins confessed up to date, guess what? It starts becoming part of a lifestyle. And you begin to carry it out the door with you. And you begin to grow up a little bit spiritually. So the idea is, is that the first point of overcoming your sin nature is to operate clean from the priesthood and you, you're not going to make it part of your life until you get a big stack of Bible classes where you're reminded over and over and over again, hey, you need Lucifer rejected his priesthood, and that's why it's an issue with you. See, we're living in a spiritual battle. God has called us to operate clean from our priesthood. And so... Rebound is the first issue in breaking the dominance of the sin nature. It unleashes the power of the Spirit in the life. The second issue is that you, the Spirit has no fuel, it has no material to work with without doctrine. Doctrine is the material that God the Holy Spirit uses to build, to operate. And so you need the Word of God installed in your soul. We call it GAP, the Grace Apparatus for Perception. That means anybody can do it if they stick with it. If they're a plugger, they're not a quitter. Anybody can do it, and that means there's no excuses. The third issue is that you are identified with something in the church age, and God did this for you. It's not part of any other dispensation. You're identified not only with the spiritual death of Christ, but also the physical death. And you are uh, identified with the burial. And see, we call that R1. The first reckoning, one, two, and three, is burial and resurrection. Death, burial. And then R2 is the second reckoning where you're identified with the resurrection, the ascension, and the session of Christ. And so <clears throat> we are to reckon upon these things and only then do we begin to understand who we really are. 
and that the truth is God has produced psychology from the Bible and obviously God made the human soul and so he knows what it needs to function correctly and uh, you don't see modern psychology world psychology tells you you've got to learn how to love all of you and they want to try to build you up but God says no I, what, what did he do with your old man? He drove nails through him. So God doesn't want you to love all of you. See, the part of you that produces human good and sin is no good. And he drove nails through it just so we could get the idea of his thought about the old sin nature. What part of you is good then? The part of you that's identified with Christ and his victory and resurrection. See, he overcame all fallen angels, operational type, in coming out of the grave. In his ascension, he led captivity captive. It was the first phase of free Ambrose, the victory parade. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father, in the place of power and authority, awaiting orders. And with the trumpet call of God and the voice of an archangel, first the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's the next great event. See, you're identified with it, and your real life is there in Christ with God. You're identified with it. And the second phase of three Ambrose will happen as little as seven years from right now. That's truth. We may not make it through this Bible class. We may see the rapture. And so, knowing who you are, you are a, more than a victor in Christ. You are royalty. You're a royal family member. And royalty functions with class and distinction. See, you're an overcomer. And you have chose the winning team if you're a believer in Christ. This, this earth is not your home. You're pilgrims here. You're camping out here, as it, will, as it were. And the world that we're living in is fake. It's a smoke screen. I found a verse this morning. I was just thumbing through it. And, oh, my goodness. It's exactly what I've been preaching. And I don't know how I forgot about it. In 2 Corinthians 4, it's talking about the ministry. See, we're talking about who you really are in Christ. Paul starts talking about the ministry. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. See, that means we don't give up, even though we're enduring pressure and adversity. We keep on high-stepping. We are perplexed but not in despair. in despair. Do you know what that means? Adversity is inevitable. Stress is optional. Persecuted, but not forsaken. See, Jesus Christ says, you are never alone. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body. That means in phase two, the dying of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? To live is Christ and to die is gain. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. What's the purpose for phase two living? To manifest the life of Christ. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. That means that Christian persecution was at an all-time high. But guess what? The church grew faster under this persecution then than it ever has now. You ought to take notes on that. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. That means that the ministry is promoting the life of the believer. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to... To what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. 
knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. That means he's developing a personal sense of destiny here and he's looking forward to the rapture of the church where we'll receive a resurrection body. And he's believing at this time that he may see it while he's alive. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. In other words, he is preaching and he wants them not to praise him, but to focus on thanks towards God for the grace that was given them. Therefore, we do not lose heart. That means his passion, his desire, his, his uh, attitude on life. He's not giving up. So he still has the passion. He still has the desire to get it done. And do you know what? If you don't have your eyes on the Lord, you're going to lose heart. You got your eyes on the world. You got your eyes on man. You're going to lose heart. Get your eyes on Jesus Christ. Even though our outward man, that means our physical body, is perishing. That means it's failing. It's going away. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. That means when we stick with Bible doctrine, our new man is fortified. He is advancing. He's growing. He's strengthening. He's providing that passion, that desire for life. You see, inside Paul, he was as ferocious as a lion. But on the outside, he knew his body was frail. It was weak. And it couldn't, he, it couldn't go on. See, he's dying on the outside. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that means phase two is a drop in the bucket, he is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That means his personal sense of destiny is shooting right past this life and it's shooting right to the idea that I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ at Bema and for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You see, his, his mind is set on that day. While we do not look at the things which are seen, the smoke screen around you is fake. This, this life is false. What you're hearing on the news is false. What you're seeing out in the world is false. Everything around you is false. A world is coming that is much more real than the one you see now. We do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. We're developing a personal sense of our own destiny and Jesus Christ is coming back and he's bringing his kingdom and he is going to remove all unbelievers from earth and he is going to set up a perfect monarchy in Jerusalem at the millennial temple and he is going to reign and rule as the lion of the tribe of Judah and you and I are going to be there. For the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal. Oh my goodness. Oh my. If you don't have any doctrine in our day and age, you're ruined. You're ruined by watching the news. You're ruined by listening to your friends. Oh, how you need the word of God so you can have a personal sense of your own destiny and it's right there in Christ. Right there, friend. And so you've got to know who you are in Christ and know that 60% of biblical prophecy has already been fulfilled and the 40% that is left is coming, friend. It is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? Point four, we learn the lust patterns of the old sin nature and we understand the motivation of most of the world out here because of it. Last week, we looked at discipline of thought. Discipline of thought. You have to make a conscience, a conscious effort. That means that you're filtering the thoughts that come through your mind. 
to identify temptations and areas of failure. You see, if you fail, you make a note. I, I, I built a business on writing down failures. I worked for five years on race car engines, and every time I saw a failure, I made a note. I said, don't do this. Don't do this. And believe it or not, the same failures happened over and over. So it was, it was uh, solidified. Oh, please don't do this. And so uh, you make good notes. And then you find out where, you, where failures happened and you stay away from them. Well, guess what? If you're, if you're addicted to uh, heroin, you say, well, I have been tempted to do heroin, and although I'm clean now, I know it's an area of temptation for me. Guess what? You've got to stay away from where they sell the heroin. You've got to stay away from friends that do heroin. You gotta, maybe you may have to move towns. Maybe you have to change your phone number. You see, how do you overcome? You've got to learn how to overcome if you fail. And so the idea is, is that you're conscious, you're, you are understanding the areas where you failed before and you're figuring how to, how to solve the problem. Hopefully you're using some doctrine along the way and some common sense. So discipline of thought. You have to have a discipline of thought and you have to know where you failed before and you have to, here's what comes next. Habituate a new man response. That means that if you fail before, you've got to do it right 20 times in a row before it becomes habit. Now, when I was in reversionism, I, used, I had a colorful vocabulary that was full of adjectives. And uh, because my friends spoke that way, and I thought it was cool to speak like they spoke. But then I, I came home from the famine, if you will, and uh, then I realized my language was, was not correct for a, a person who's born again. And then I began to work. And then, do you know that a, a person that uses a lot of perversities and foul language usually is not very high IQ. Uh, they, they don't have a big IQ, so they just fill in with their speech a lot of profanity. But did you know when you stop using profanity, you got to find new words. And uh, you, you, well, what goes there when I'm trying to create a sentence? And then all of a sudden, your vocabulary widens. And did you know part of intelligence is having a wide vocabulary? And without a wide vocabulary, you, have, you don't have the capacity for thought. And so what I had to do was I had to have discipline of thought and I had to have a filter. See, okay, I've got to think about what I'm going to say here. And when I began to teach the Word of God, I still had that from however many years ago. And guess what? I had to strengthen it because you make mistakes when you're speaking from the pulpit and you want to say, oh, darn it. You know what the Bible says? The mature man or woman has learned how to bridle his tongue. Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. See, you've got to habituate a new man response. It's got to be, become part of your life. And once you learn how to speak without using perversities and profanities, guess what? You do it 20 times in a row and it's solidified and now you're functioning correctly, see? It hurts though. It's painful to change. And that's what people don't like is pain. 
Well, once you have some semblance of maturity, you can move on from super grace to ultra super grace. That is your true destiny in this life is to cross the Jordan now and enter the promised land. Now the problem is, is that from super grace to ultra super grace, there is a desert in between. Place of no man's land. That's where you're going to pass eight categories of momentum testing before God allows you to enter the promised land in this life. So only the mature Christian recognizes when the sin nature has gotten the best of him and he spends a maximum amount of time in fellowship and a minimal amount of time in carnality. And so you see, breaking the dominance of the sin nature is not automatic and that baby Christians spend most of the time in the flesh they may have been born again for 40 years and still a baby. And so you've got to uh, follow the ideas here if you're going to grow up at any time and begin to overcome your old sin nature. Now, this answers the question, do you have to sin? And I, I hope you've answered it for yourself. Some people say, well, you're just going to sin, so just get it out of the way and rebound. And while that's good and fine and that, that, that uh, teaches a life of grace, Paul says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, heaven forbid. He says, no, we ought not to. And so uh, the idea is, is that you can overcome your failures in the areas where you've, tempt, where you've been tempted in the past and failed, you can overcome, but it's not going to be automatic. It's not. You've got to pick up your spiritual life, and you've got to begin to feed your new man and uh, carry on. And so this is the idea that you can overcome temptation, and you don't have to sin. Although most people, when they're sinning, they're just acting normal. They're doing what comes natural. See that? They don't think about it. That's because they have habituated an old man reaction. And that's how they fall through life. They're just going through life feeling blindly, trying to miss the potholes and the landmines and the briars and the barbed bob wire. And they're just pain, life of pain is what I call it, trying to make it through. And so the idea is, is that you can overcome the temptation to sin, but only the mature Christian is the one who recognizes in short order, hey, here comes a temptation, and I'm going to sidestep this thing. And so now you've got to go down this list and see where you're at. Where are you? Where have you made it to? And I hope that you continue on. I do want to uh, review this next mechanics um, in taking off the old man. When you take off the old man, you're not only functioning clean in the priesthood, but you're, you're taking off that clothing, that habituated old man reaction. So you're taking that off and you're putting on the new man, which is a new man response. So let's look at this real quick. We understand that life impresses upon us. We're born into the world and we're watching mommy and daddy to see how they solve problems. And I tell you what, I, I was raised under, I think what have, had to be some of the, the best conditions a young person could ever be raised under. Thanks mom and dad. I was raised, I was born in Texas, hallelujah. It's, it's a, Texas is boss and the 49 other states are slaves. Do you know why? 
Texas is the only state in the union that legally can secede. Better understand that. And I'm a native Texan. That's on my birth certificate. So, hallelujah, I was born not only in the South, the Bible Belt, but I was also born a Texan. Secondly, I came in contact with the gospel at a fairly young age, and I was born again. And then thirdly, I'm into contact with Bible doctrine. And my mom said, without, without the colonel and his teaching, I never would have gotten lined out. She was the one. My dad was mostly religious. He was a Southern Baptist. You couldn't black. I, you asked my dad to the day he died, when is the Sabbath, Dad? It's Sunday. You ought not work on Sunday. I mean, he was hardcore. But, <clears throat> so you grow up and you're watching how mom and dad handle life. And I, I, am the, I, am, I have decided I wanted to concentrate on all the positive parts of my upbringing. I think that made the difference. If you want to concentrate on all the negatives, you're, go, you're hoeing the wrong row, friend. You're going to look for every offense. Every, see, every little infraction against you, you're going to be personally feeling violated. That is a terrible personality. Terrible. You're reacting to every small infraction and injustice? Look, why don't you conclude to concentrate on the positive? And maybe even people you love have bad days. Don't follow them. Smile and say, I love you too. I'm going out here to hoe in the garden. You see, life impresses on us and we get to choose what we want to have as our thought pattern. Maybe mom and dad didn't handle every situation perfectly and you as a little kid, you're watching there to see how they handle it. Well, guess what? As adults, most people grow up and they either do exactly like their parents did or exactly the opposite. They say, I don't want to be a drunk like my old man, so I'm a teetotaler and I won't touch a drop of liquor, but they've got stomach ulcers over here because... Paul says, take, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. You see, the idea is, is that uh, you, you're just as bad as they are. You didn't handle life correctly as the Word of God tells you to. And so life impresses upon us, and each one of us are uh, impacted by the world, and it's human viewpoint and old man solutions. It's how most of the world handles life. And I tell you, the home ought to be a retreat, a, a place of refuge for children. And uh, I, <clears throat> I believe so much in it that when we were raising our kids, even, even though at times me and my wife were at each other's throat, we wouldn't, do, we wouldn't show it in front of our kids. We wanted them to have a place of peace, not warfare. And the, the home ought not be a place of warfare. And a lot of people, a lot of kids learn how to live in the home looking at mommy and daddy and how they handle things. And uh, you ought to be, see, you're an adult, you have a child. And the whole point of rearing children is to raise them up where they have an adult soul to match their adult body. And warfare in the home destroys that. Well, you learn how to handle life, whether it's your parents, your friends, your teachers, classmates, whatever. So you develop how to handle problems and you make subconscious old man reactions. Someone gets mad at you, you just Get mad at them and raise the bar. That's normal. Thank God for agape love. It, it has taught me how to not only be a, a better human, 
But would you believe that being a, a manager of a race car engine shop, that I, I go work a, at a psychological institution where we also build race car engines. And every morning, Monday morning, I've got to go through uh, the behavioral sciences with my employees, and some of them have adult bodies and the soul of children, and they don't have any tools to handle life. And I've got to look at them and try to figure out what has happened to them during the time they were off on Friday on a Saturday and Sunday because now they're a different person. And so, I'm, and I'm dealing with customers and they've gone out and blown up their race car engine that cost $40,000 over the weekend and they spent their life savings on it and now it's a pile of rubble. And so now I've got to try to console them. And did you, did you realize that integrity that's built up from the Word of God, it helps you in every aspect of life. Not just your spiritual life. So you learn how to make a subconscious old man reaction and until you recognize that, you, you're not made it far. You've got to learn how to overcome that. But you were born again. And the Bible says that at that point, we ought to get rehabilitated from our world uh, psychology, our worldview. Romans 12, 2 says, be metamorphosized by the word of God. And then we develop discipline and thought, hopefully somewhere along the way. We try and try again, and guess what? The winner is not somebody who has tried and never failed. The winner is somebody who has tried and failed and picked themselves up and tried again. And tried and failed and picked themselves up and tried again. And tried and failed. And a hundred times they tried and failed and they picked themselves up and they continued to try. They never gave up. That's who the winner is. He's a plugger. He's not a quitter. And it's, you got you to be tough. Called mental courage or mental strength. And we finally developed a conscious new man response. In other words, I'm thinking about what is happening here. And I'm, I'm hitting the brakes. And I'm going to use, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use doctrine. I'm going to do what I believe the Bible's telling me to do here. This is where we begin to cultivate the Christian way of life and super grace living. Bringing every thought into captivity for Christ. So you have some semblance of maturity, but God's going to make sure before you fight the giant that you can swat the mosquito. And you swat the mosquito with the same tool that you kill the giant with and so <clears throat> no man's land is a reiteration of testing over and over to make sure that you've got it before he lets you stand in front of a giant and then you have ultra super grace where the believer is no longer even tempted to do that which he was tempted with before it's an automatic application of the Word of God. So it's a subconscious new man response. He, see, he's so used to using agape love now that you can't get him excited about anything. He's bulletproof. It, in a horse, it's called bombproof. He's seen it all. There's nothing that can get him excited. I think about uh, General Robert E. Lee. He always, he had several horses, but he rode, the one he liked the best was called Traveler. And uh, I believe he was a, uh, a walking horse, but he would ride up and down the line encouraging the troops to 
uh, aim, aim and squeeze, aim and squeeze, and not to jerk triggers and to uh, stay calm, cool, and collected and do your job and uh, you know, keep the enemy busy and keep their head down. And so he would ride up and down uh, the line of troops and he was riding traveler and one time uh, the, the, the horse obviously was bomb proof because there's muskets going off and bullets flying and, and, and any other horse would be spooking and jerking and jumping but one time a shell landed an artillery shell landed close to the horse and it spooked and if you've ever ridden horses, you know they can just jump sideways right out from under you. I mean, you're, you're going to hit the ground. And uh, the general hit the ground and broke both of his uh, wrists. I don't know the bones up here, but he broke both of them when he hit the ground. And uh, he continued to serve as the general of the southern armies, even with two broken wrist and so uh, when I when I think about <clears throat> the mature Christian he he's bomb proof but there's still a chance that he may fail from time to time so even the mature Christian can get flacked by artillery and jump sideways and get off course for a moment but guess what it's not for long. He recognizes his failures. He keeps short account with God, and he gets right back in fellowship, and that's the idea. It's not that you'll ever stop sinning. It's that when you do sin, you keep it on a short list with God. And so there are the mechanics behind overcoming the dominance of the sin nature and my, my prayer for you during all this is that you've listened objectively and you've viewed my presentation here in the light of God's Word. That's what I want you to see. You may not have heard it this way before, but what I want, to, what you, I want you to understand is the fact that you don't have to sin. We do sin. The baby believer sins because he doesn't even think about it. It's natural. The mature believer sins, but it's, a momentary lapse where he gets right back in fellowship and he uses the tools that God has given him. And so here's the idea, taking off the old man. How do you do it? Well, you can start at point one and that's taking off the old man clothing. But you've got to continue on if you want to have that new man lifestyle that we're fishing to study next. So we're going to take a break right here and then we're going to enter the exegesis of our next verse, verse 23. We'll have some corrections to be made. How to recover the spiritual life. He says, take off the old man in our previous verse. And now the function of gap. And be renewed or restored and the spirit or breathing of your mind or soul. So let's take a look at the exegesis. One of my favorite verses because it not only mentions soul breathing, but uh, it has to do with two different categories of life that I love. Ephesians 4.23 then in the Greek. This is the resumption of a of gap, that means learning doctrine, and reversion recovery. In other words, how do you get back on track? The word and in the English is a continuative use of the particle da. It relates to everything to what has just been said in the previous verse, I mean taking off your old man. In addition to putting off the old man, it is necessary to gap it daily to recover from reversionism. And that is the next phrase in the English. The word that is merely a device to translate the infinitive of purpose. Purpose. 
you be renewed. The next phrase in the English is the present passive infinitive. Ana noeo. Ana noeo. This means to be restored rather than renewed. Ana is again and again. Noeo to renew. So renew again and again means restoration. The present tense is an iterative, iterative, iterative present which describes that which recurs in successive intervals. Therefore, it is the present tense of repeated action and it indicates the fact that you don't just take in doctrine once in a while but has to be a continuous thing both for reversion recovery as well as moving towards super grace. Consistency is the concept. Consistent function of gap for reversion recovery and also for achieving the tactical objective of the super grace status. The present tense is in contrast to the aorist. Apothotithomy of the previous verse where we have put off concerning the former conversation. So to put off is the aorist tense in a moment in time. You put off the old man. But here, to be renewed or restored is a stack of Bible classes. Consistency in Bible class. The aorist tense was used for rebound. The present tense is used for gap after rebound. The passive voice, the believer in reversionism, recovers by the consistent use of gap. And like the previous infinitive, pathotithomy, it indicates a purpose or design for your life. So it should be translated, and that you be restored. I love the fa I love the looking at the, you walk through the junkyard and you see a, a heap of junk. And you look at that thing and you see the potential. And your mind just goes wild with, oh man, I, there's, what could I do with that rusty hunk of metal? And I am a sucker for a rusty hunk. I love to see the potential in something. And man, I, that, that could be something great. And then I drag it home. And some of my projects do turn out great. I can polish those things up, and man, what comes out the other side of six months of labor and a stack of $100 bills? Sometimes it's great. And most of the time I have to sell it after I get through because then I don't have any money, you know, I can't keep it. So that's just the cycle of my life, but that's also the free market. So watch. You're a junk pile in the scrap heap and God's looking at you and he wants to restore you to glory. Bible doctrine is the sandpaper, the sandblaster, the tool that he's going to use to grow you up. And all you've got to do is expose yourself to the master craftsman's techniques. If you reject, you'll stay in the scrapyard of life headed for the meltdown bin, the crusher. I, see, I, that's a wonderful word for me. Restore, I love it. And that you be restored. In the spirit is the next phrase in the English. Really bad translation, actually. It's the dative singular neuter of pneuma should be translated in the breathing. And that means soul breathing and the function of gap. And we're going to take a look at that with a diagram. Of your mind is the next phrase in the English. It's a noun genitive singular of masculine of noose. The human soul is designed to run on truth. Aletheia. The left lobe is the staging area. Truth. 
So I'm going to stop and have some fun here. We'll we'll look at several diagrams and <clears throat> give you at least one today. So if you look at the internal combustion engine, I like the four-stroke variant, what you have in most of your vehicles in America. They, they operate more efficiently than they actually should according to science, and that's what we call volumetric efficiency. That's how far beyond 100% can, can we function in the internal combustion engine. And uh, in my business, uh, we're looking to get beyond 120% volumetric efficiency, where we're actually doing way more with an engine than what should be possible. And there, there are two inventions of mankind that operate beyond what science says they should do. And uh, one is the internal combustion engine, it functions better than science shit says it ought to. And the second is the firearm. There are two areas that your government has gone to war against internal combustion, which is more efficient than anything we do in life, and a firearm. And so with one, you can carry the word of God, and with the other, you can protect the word of God. What does our government hate? So you better figure out some truth and start thinking right. So watch this. I'm going to relate soul breathing to internal combustion. So if you take a look at, we're going to look at one cylinder. I like the V8 pushrod variant of the inter internal combustion engine. I think that's why I was born. It looks like we're only going to get to use it for about 200 years of human history. You know, it's, it's invented back here, and then here I am right in its heyday, and it looks like we're going down now, and people are going to begin to accept a less efficient way of travel just to get over people who are offended by burning dead dinosaurs. But what, guess what happens? Here I am right in the middle of the golden heyday of the V8 pushrod motor. Here I am. I love God and what he's done for me. He made me for this. And so you have a cylinder here, and we're going to put a piston in here. This piston's going to move up and down the cylinder. Yeah, I can move down. Okay, we're okay. And it's got a connecting rod. And it's going to connect to a crankshaft out of here. So that crankshaft is going to turn. Well, what makes it turn? So we've got the cylinder head. You got to have a lid to your combustion chamber. And most efficient lid is the hemispherical combustion chamber. And we're going to put a spark plug right here. And uh, this spark plug, we're going to relate to the spiritual life. Let's put an intake port over here. Let me see. Intake valve here. Let's put an exhaust port over here. Exhaust valve here. Now, when the piston travels down, 
it creates an absence of pressure. In other words, the atmospheric pressure outside is higher that than when the piston goes down. Some people call it a vacuum. It's not a true vacuum. It's an absence of pressure. And so the atmosphere wants in to fill that void. So you open the intake valve, and when you do, you're going to bring it, the atmosphere, through a carburetor. And this carburetor is going to mix the atmosphere with fuel. I'm going to put a booster hanging down there. Now it's going to spray some fuel. Let's put blue in there. So now you've got atomization and you've got an intake charge that's complete with atmosphere and the fuel you're going to run. Now, this is drawn down into the cylinder. And when you think of airflow into an engine, don't think about a single molecule. Think about an intake charge being like a rope. If you've ever thrown a lariat, you know uh, rope. You know how rope behaves. And uh, let's say you put that rope up on a shelf and you yerk the end of it. What's going to happen to that coil of rope? It's going to come uncoiled and it's going to go down. It's following. And so through molecular adhesion, you're going to have an intake charge. And when you're pulling that air through an intake port, it's called the black art of engine airflow. That's what I do every day. And Jesus says, you don't see the air from where it comes or where it goes, but you see its effects. And that's what I do. And so you see the rope of air, the intake charge. Now it's sporadic because this valve is going to close once the piston gets down to bottom dead center and starts coming back up slightly. Then we're going to close these. The, that was, that's called one stroke, the intake stroke. Piston's headed down, creates an absence of pressure. The intake charge comes in. It's atmosphere mixed with fuel, and it's got oxygen in there, which we need to burn fuel. That piston's going to go down to bottom dead center, and then when it starts coming back up, we're going to shut the intake valve. We're going to shut the exhaust valve. Now we got the compression stroke. And we're going to compress that air-fuel mixture. And the piston's coming up, and it's compressing, compressing, compressing. And now, and that's called the compression stroke, right before top dead center, we're going to fire the spark plug. I should have used, let's use a different color. Wait, she wants red. And when you fire that plug, you've got to fire it before the piston gets to the top because you've got to get that air fuel charge burning and you want maximum pressure on the way down. And then so in order to hit that maximum pressure curve, you've got to light the fire before the piston gets to the top and so that you get maximum drive of that piston down the cylinder. And that's called the power stroke. And when that piston is driven down the cylinder... That's where you get rotational force, right here. And you're going to drive that crankshaft in a circle. Now that crankshaft is hooked onto your clutch and transmission drive line and eventually the wheels, and that's going to propel you down the road. But that's not the end. You've got to get rid of the residual, the byproducts of combustion. And so we've driven on the power stroke, we've driven that piston down the cylinder. And we're going to open the exhaust valve with that piston on the way down. And when the piston starts coming back up, it's going to force the byproducts of combustion out. And that's called your exhaust. Let's do... It's not good, so let's use a bad color. And here's the byproducts of combustion. Now, the good news is, is that we can use this. And that, that exhaust gas 
when you break that exhaust valve open, have you ever seen a top fuel dragster and the fire that comes out the headers? That's raw fuel burning. You get air moving at the speed of sound out of the engine. Well, we're not going to waste that. What we're going to do, see, remember that air moves like a rope? It's moving really fast out of the motor. We're going to open the intake valve while it's still moving out really fast. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to draw a new atmospheric charge across the engine. And even part of it may escape out the header. And that's when you see a race car shooting flames. Because he's drawing across. It's called cross flow at overlap. It's the strongest signal in the engine. You would think the piston going down and the atmospheric deviation would be the strongest, but it's not. The strongest signal in the engine is when both valves are open and you've got a cross flow across the cylinders. That is what creates volumetric efficiency in the 100 plus range. And so in the internal combustion engine, you've got all of these variables. You've got the intake port and its flow and its configuration. You've got the power stroke and opening the valves at the right time there. And then you've got cross flow and all that is controlled by your camshaft. Well, when we get everything correct, our valves opening and closing at the right moment, our intake port shape right, our exhaust port shape right, the links of them right, we can get into the volumetric efficiencies of 120% plus. It's amazing to see what can happen. Now, I'm going to relate this to the spiritual life, and I can only relate part of it to the spiritual life and not all of it. So let's see what we can do. The fuel in your spiritual life is Bible doctrine. And until you get some gas in the tank, you're going nowhere. Okay? So you've got to mix doctrine without, and then, and then the spark plug is faith. You've got to believe the Word of God before it becomes real in your life. And until you turn on the switch and get some ignition, you've got no power got no power in the Christian way of life. Then, when you do finally light the fire, you get application. This is called Sophia in the Word of God, or dunamis, power, explosive power. You may start out in the Christian way of life with a Briggs and Stratton that makes five horsepower, you may end up with a top fuel engine that makes 10,000. See, how much power you have in the Christian way of life, how much doctrine do you have? How much faith do you have? How much power do you have? But there's always the byproducts of combustion. And so we're getting rid of all of that is bad in the Christian way of life, the old man thinking. The old man in his clothing is out. We have the byproducts of combustion in our engines, and you know them as exhaust gases, fumes. You have to change your oil in your car every once in a while. That's because some of the byproducts of combustion get by the rings and down into the, the oil. And if you wanted to relate oil to this, it's the Holy Spirit, the lifeblood. You've got to have oil in your engine for it to survive. And so here we see the word of God mixed with faith equals power. The application in the Christian way of life and it propels you until you have doctrine and you have faith. You've got no power in the Christian way of life. So we've related the function of gap or soul breathing. And this is how an engine breathes. And this is how the soul breathes. Truth in, power out. The old man expelled as residual the byproducts of combustion. The good is used for motivation. 
All right, let's get, are we okay with that diagram? Any questions? It's the only part of it can be related. I can't talk about all of the engine and relate it to the Christian way of life, but we can talk about breathing, soul breathing. All right, let's use another illustration. And I would probably be better off just talking about this one, but I'll try to diagram it. Let's take your noggin. That's an ugly old head. Oh, yeah. Right. Let's put some good shoulders on this guy. Put him out here. But inside that chest is going to be some lungs in there. Okay, so the body itself, the human body, can be related to soul breathing, and we're gonna we're gonna draw a diagram that exactly replicates soul breathing in it. There's another aspect of human life where we can relate breathing. And you, uh, you have to have oxygen to survive. And uh, so in order to get it into your body, you have uh, lungs and you have a, a system where you can breathe in the atmosphere. And only part of that atmosphere is oxygen. And we're going to take in that oxygen, we're going to absorb it into our body by lungs, and it's going to be transferred into our bloodstream. And then it's going to perform, perform a lot of functions, but uh, I'm a runner, so I want to relate it to that. So you're running, and what happens when you run? When you first start, you start getting fatigue. And what is that fatigue that you're running into? Most of the time, it's lactic lactic acid that builds up in your muscles and they start getting tight and it, everything inside you tells you to quit and that lactic acid is speaking to you because it hurts the buildup of that lactic and eventually you just have to stop. Well, how do you get rid of lactic acid? The, one of the f main ways you do it is breathing. And so what happens when you start running? You start breathing harder, don't you? Well, eventually as a runner, you begin to balance your breathing in your lactic threshold. That means how long can you hold that stride? If you're sprinting, you can't hold it that long. But it maybe if you're running slow, you might be able to develop uh, some distance. And that's called your lactic threshold. And breathing is the way to get rid of lactic acid. One of the ways we, our body gets rid of it in other ways, but it's slower. So breathing is the fastest way to get, get rid of it. And once you build up when you're running, then you'll find out that you can go beyond what you thought were your limits. And when I first started running, I didn't follow any of the science, and I got injured fairly quickly. You get the shin splints. And you got to recover from that. And then you get a pulled muscle, and you got to recover from that. And then finally, you start reading. You say, okay, well, maybe somebody's done this before. Oh, let me read a little bit, and let me study. And so there's uh, a lot of people write about it, and you can study, and you can spend your whole life doing this thing. And I'm not telling you to get caught up in running. Bible doctrine's got to be in first place. But Paul says that exercise is good. And so you need 30 minutes of cardio every other day. And that's good. But doctrine is better. In other words, he says the spiritual life is far better than physical exercise. And he knew both. So you'll find out that you can go further, faster, and longer than you ever thought you could. All it takes is consistency. And you build up day after day. And as long as you follow a good program and you don't get injured and you don't get into any of those uh, 
flaws out there that you can get in. You can continue the advance, and it's called a build-up. And you're building up towards a goal. So you set a goal out here. I want to run a marathon in five hours. And you do the workouts, and you do a build-up, and you begin to build your lactic threshold. And you go up, and you keep on running, and keep on exercising your diet, and your supplements is right. And then finally you get to your marathon and boom, you do it. You run 459.59 and you've broken the five-hour barrier in the marathon and you never thought it was possible. And then you say, what if I could break four and a half hours? And then you do another build-up and you start over. And uh, the fastest marathoner in the world, right now he lives, they say fastest ever, but they forget about the Nephilim, so they didn't include that part of human history, and they could run way faster than any mar marathoner now. The fastest modern marathon runner comes out of Kenya, Hippokochi, I think that's how they say his name, and uh, see, I want equality. Why can't I run like him? That's foolish. He says, anything is possible. That's his motto. Humans are limitless. You think you can do it, you can do it. And so that's partly arrogance because testing will show you can't do everything, but you got to at least think you can. And uh, his official marathon time is uh, two hours and one minute, which is he's running four-minute miles the whole way. It's amazing. And he just breezes. He looks like he's not even working. He's learned how to run fast and relaxed, and that's really hard to do. I had actually, this past year, I had a really good year of running. And I, at 50 years old, I ran faster in, in every category than I'd ever run. I'm talking about even in junior high and high school, I did a lot of running. I ran a 642 mile. I'd never been faster than about 650 something. I uh, ran my fastest 5K this year, 2138. I'd never been past about 24. I ran my fastest half marathon. It was an hour and 40-something minutes. I'd never been below 150. 50 years old now. I'm trying to teach you that if you do a build-up and you think it's possible, you can, as long as you don't get injured and you keep on the right track. And then my dream was to be able to run a sub-four-hour marathon, and this year I ran 350 flat, and I did it. And I was like, how did that happen? I just stuck with the program, and I, I accomplished what I never thought I could ever do and all I had to do was just stick with it when well, your spiritual life you can accomplish more than you ever thought you ever could as long as you put your nose to the grindstone and don't look you look up you stick with the program and out here on the other side see you have developed a spiritual life and what was so hard before it was hard to run even a 10 minute mile because the lactic acid built up in your life and you you had to stop and you got out here and you acclimated to this and you began to ramp up and you kept on track and you kept going. And guess what? Out here you're standing at Bema and you're receiving your crown of glory, your crown of righteousness, your crown of life. You're getting a new uniform, the uniform of glory out here and you never thought it was possible down here over in this area. So the idea is, is that you're going to breathe in truth and you're going to breathe out and that is the byproduct is the old man function you're going to get rid of it we don't need any of that lactic acid in our life we don't need any of that used oxygen burned up out here and so soul breathing can be related to uh, running or any other activity where you build up lactic acid whether it's biking rowing Walking, anything. Well, next week we'll start out with breathing of soul and we'll actually diagram gap and how truth flows through the human soul and how we develop a spiritual life. I want to thank you for your attention and attendance. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed and I want to do a roll call. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you that we can be restored by soul breathing. Thank you for the means, and we uh, steady ourselves under your skillful hand as you work on us 
and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.